we what we're going to embark upon. This was the very first teaching in Bible college when I was asked to teach a, an adult Bible class. This is what I started, I taught, and it was this fundamental doctrines of Christ. And uh, so it's been a part of my heart. I've probably taught this over the years, probably maybe ten times. Uh, um, but we're kind of back to this place again. And uh, as a, a man in his, uh, an elderly man said to me, who had been a Christian his whole life, he said, I thought I knew it all. How, what are you going to teach me? Seven basic doctrines. He goes, I, I, I got that down. But at the end of the teaching, he came back with great repentance and acknowledging, I didn't know it all. And every time we go through these teachings, the more profound I feel they become, they certainly become for me. But uh, we're laying a solid foundation, and there is no other foundation that can be laid. We have to have Jesus Christ is the foundation. But we have to have the Bible is fundamental to everything that we are. In, in so many ways, uh, this is probably as close as we can get to physically touching Jesus today. This is as close, this is how the close we can get to literally touching Jesus. A book that was written over 1,400 years by 43 different writers. 1,400 years. And 43 different writers, shepherds and prophets and kings and priests. And, and you're going to have a, you're going to have consistency. That is a miracle. That is an absolute miracle. It just can't happen. Oh, one man can write a book. Or one woman can write a book. They can. One man can write a holy book. One person can write a book. Any book written by one single man, I have a hard time with. I, I'm going to look at that with a great, great grain of salt. Now, there are great books out there. The, the Passion Version was written by one man. And, and the Message, there's other versions that have been written. Um, but I'm going to take. I'm going to approach those books kind of at arm's length. I'm going to take them with a certain grain of salt, because if it's been written by one person, I'm going to I'm going to take a I'm going to go slow with a lot of discernment, look going into that book. Uh, and when we have other books like the New American Standard that was written by 300 people, scholars getting together and working together on a book to come up with a consensus using the original languages, it changes the entire perspective. And so I feel much more confident going into a book like the New American Standard uh, or the American Standard Version and, and some of the other versions that were written by a group, a large group of theologians mm -hmm. and, and doctors of of theology and, and linguistics to put to, to, to go and scour the, the manuscripts, I, I feel much more comfortable uh, uh, looking at something like that. But one thing I can say of true, uh, uh, there are hundreds of versions, and I have done exercises where I've looked at like 40 different versions wow. to, uh, as I've been researching different things. And what I have found consistently but on those books that have God's anointing upon them, what I find consistently, consistently is they're consistent. I mean, they, they may uh, differ a little bit here and there on, on what English word are we going to use. They may differ a little bit, but fundamentally they all are in agreement. Every single one of them that I've looked at says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I don't care what translation translation I have gone through, I have found them to be consistent uh, with that scripture. Our fund, this is our foundation scripture. This is our anchor scripture for all these teachings. And the anchor scripture is Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. And Cheryl, can you read that up? Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings or baptisms, and laying on of the hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So in this scripture, what are, can you tell me what the seven basic doctrines are? Sharp? Jim, what are they? What? Faith. Washing baptisms. Laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead. And eternal judgment. These are the basics. 
of what we believe as believers in Jesus. And you'll notice it starts off, the number one starts off with the number one is maturity. This is fundamental. Now, if you get together with uh, Christians, even ministers, and if you want to just have some fun, ask them, what are the seven fundamental doctrines or basic doctrines of, of Christ? What are, what are our basic doctrines? And you'll hear, at least in my experience, you'll hear all kinds of different things. Well, it's love. Well, it's uh, forgiveness. It's, uh, I'll hear, you'll hear all kinds of things. But I, I have yet, in my own experience, had anyone respond to me and say, well, it's repentance, faith. Uh, baptisms, laying out of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, and maturity. I have not had that experience. But this is us fundamentally. So the Bible is a, a lamp under our feet. It is a light unto our path. Psalms 119, 105. And it says the commandment is a lamp. This is the lamp. And teaching the revelation is the light. So the word is the, the lamp, teaching is the light. So that's what we're doing. So uh, I want to put this prayer out here for us all to say together. And, and I, So can we say this together? Help me, Father, to have the mind of a student, the heart of a disciple, the will of a saint, the understanding of a mature child of God. That's what I want. Amen? Yes, so the first doctrine that we're going to talk about is the doctrine of repentance. And um, we'll see if we get through this today. Um, but anyway, we're going to start off with repentance. And repentance in its fundamental definition is just turn around. Just turn around. That's, that's, that's what it basically means. But look at this. It says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Now, isn't that curious? Because what is the first word of the gospel? The first word. The first word is and. repent. The first word is repent. And isn't that kind of odd in a way? Because wouldn't you kind of, wouldn't it be sort of natural you'd think that you would want to walk up to somebody and want them to believe? Did you talk to them about believing in God? But we're going to start off with repent. And that is the worst first word of the Bible gospel is repent. So wouldn't it be interesting if we went up to people that said uh, that, that, that advocated uh, uh, atheism or some other belief system, and we said to them, well, that's all well and good, but you need to repent. Well, I don't believe in God. I'm not talking about whether you believe in him or not. I'm talking about the fact that you need to repent, which means you need to turn around and change the way you think. That is a pretty challenging thing. Or like John and I were talking yesterday, yeah. uh, being able to walk up to somebody and say, that, yeah, you don't believe in God, that's fine, but when are you going to come home? Well, what are you talking about? I don't believe. I'm an idiot. Well, when are you going to come home? I have a feeling Holy Spirit's breath is going to be upon that. I have a feeling his breath will be upon. I don't, I, I'm not debating whether there's a God or not. I'm not debating whether you're right or you're wrong, or I'm right or wrong, or you believe this or believe that. That's not, I'm not going to debate that. I'm just saying is when are you going to turn around? When are you going to repent? When are you going to come home? Because that is the appeal, appeal of the Holy Spirit. A story of a, a, a little gal in uh, uh, New Orleans, a shoe shine. she had a little shoe shine box. And these rich men would come and put their feet on that shoe shine box, and uh, she would polish their shoes. And on the side of it, you know, she had this phrase, Jesus saves. And this one guy came one night, one day afternoon, he looks down, she's doing his shoes, and he looks down at that and he goes, Jesus saves? Well, I don't believe in Jesus. She said, well, that's fine, mister. But unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. And he said, well, I don't believe in any of this stuff. I don't know all that really. She goes, well, I know you don't, but unless you repent. You shall likewise perish. Well, the next day he came, knelt down at that little shoebox with that little gal and said to her, will you lead me to Jesus? Because all night long, what he kept hearing ringing in his ears, unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. And he finally turned around. Well, we need a Savior. The fact is we need a Savior because we've all had these, at least these three, we have had these three things in our hearts and in our lives. One is iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is evil actions. It is actually breaking the moral law of God. It's breaking his moral law. And more often than not, it's what we do. It's what we touch. 
It's what we're working with. It's our hands. Then the next thing is we've all sinned, which means we've come, we've missed the mark. Mm -hmm. Choosing our own way of righteousness and truth. I am not going to follow the Bible's mandates and, and definition of righteousness and truth. I'm going to do it my own way. I will be my own truth. I will define righteousness by my own heart. I will define my own reality. And I am not going to look to the Bible. That's called sin. That's called missing the mark. And then we have transgressions, which is leaving his true path and his ways and stepping over the boundaries he has set. And that's our feet. So our hands, our heart, and our feet. We're step, he sets boundaries, and we step over those boundaries, and that is transgressions. That's being almost in the will of God. Almost. I'm really close. I'm a really good person. I'm a really good religious person. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I, I, I do a lot of things that are really good. I don't. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't uh, cuss or. Or, or swear, or I, I don't uh, chew, and I don't run around with those that do. So I'm almost in the will of God. Isn't that good enough? Or like a friend of uh, a man back in the Navy days, this guy said to me, uh, I, we got to talking about the Lord. I had a revelation. I had a dream. I had to go to this guy and tell him this dream. He was a superior. Maybe you've heard the story before, but he was a superior. So I, I, we had a dinner. We went out to dinner, and I shared this dream with him. I said, first of all, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, oh, yeah, me and the big guy upstairs, we're tight. We're tight. As a matter of fact, I'm in my church every day, which is my car, listening to Neil Diamond. And I'm worshiping with Neil Diamond in my truck. And me and God, we're having a good old time. I said, well, that's interesting. But I had a dream. And in that dream, we were at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus was walking down the table greeting everybody. He got to you. I told him this. He got to you. And he looked at you and he said, friend, where's your wedding garments? And you said to him, that's why I told this man, and you said to him, I don't know. And Jesus called for these two big angels and said, remove him. Yeah. Remove him. Oh, he was tight with the big man upstairs. He was almost in the will of God. And there's a lot of people out there running around that are almost in the will of God, but they're not. And it's not okay, because it's a little bit of iniquity. It's a little bit of sin, a little bit of transgression. It's not a big deal. I just do a little of this, a little of that. It's not a big deal. No one's hurt. I'm not hurting anybody. Well, there's a way that may seem right, but the end of it is death. Seems right to me to choose this religion. Seems right to me to go to this denomination or that denomination or this place or that place. Seems right to me. But the end of it's death. So you can argue, you know, you can be in an airplane that's about to crash and they're handing out parachutes and you can say, well, I don't believe in gravity. I'm not into gravity. I'm not down with that gravity business. I'm sorry. I'm just not down with that. And, and I'm certainly, that, that is the ugliest parachute I've ever seen in my life. I am not going to put that thing on. And then you watch that plane go down. What well, seemed right to me to stick to my guns and my opinion, and to my right and wrong, seemed right to me. But when that plane crashes, you find out that gravity is gravity. And you, did, you, you refuse to take the way of escape and put a parachute on and be saved like everybody else. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, But the Spirit explicitly, explicitly says in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to, see, to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. To be out of the will of God means you must go numb that some part of your heart has to go numb to get out of the will of God and to go do your own thing. And when we say will, we always remind everyone we're talking about his plan. Will and plan are kind of interchangeable. He has a plan for your life, which is his will for your life. So, but there are deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons at work in the world that we live in today. And we will not listen or pay attention to any one of them. 
That's good. We will not. Not for a moment, not for a day. Because what has to happen is you become, the farther away you come from the will of God or the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life, the farther away you get, the harder your heart has to, has to get. Mm -hmm. And there is a hardening of the heart, which can come to the point where your conscience is completely seared, where you feel no guilt for what you're doing. A reprobate mind. There are people in this world today that are doing the things that they're doing because their conscience is so seared. I'm going to tell you something that is shocking to me. Is I don't know if you've seen the pictures of this man that was arrested for mass murders, the mass murder guy that was just recently arrested. Uh, serial killer. Serial killer. But what is really incredible is you look at this man. He's sitting there looking. The look on his face is, <coughs> I go to the movies, I go to the store, I go out to eat, and I kill a few people. Mm -hmm. It's just what I do. But the look on his face was, what's the big deal? I'm just, in other words, it wasn't the face of a demon. It wasn't a face of a hardened man that was like, oh my gosh, I've been caught. It was more like the look of a man of, oh, this is what we're doing today? His conscience is so seared that there's no perception of, you are a mass murderer. And you have no conscience that can even be touched with conviction. But, but the thing that got me when I looked at this man is he has zero conscience or sense of evil. That is a seared conscience. And when we choose to walk away from the perfect will of God, when we choose to walk away from God's plan and purposes for our lives, when we turn, choose to turn our backs on the Holy Spirit and what he's called us to do, when we turn our backs, we have to go numb on some level so that we don't feel the, we don't feel the conviction. And, it, and if that is not checked, it can lead completely to a reprobate mind. It can re lead to a seared conscience where you lack the capacity to feel conviction. Don't do that. That's not good for you. Psalm 17.10, For they have closed their unfeeling heart. With their mouth they speak proudly. Well, I believe in this and I believe in that. They've closed their unfeeling heart. Put locks over it. So what we need is, what do we do in this situation? We need repentance. Metanoia, change of mind, change of thought or feeling. A decision to change direction, to think and walk in a different direction. Be converted from one course of thought and action to another. Change of heart, change of attitude. And we do an about face. We turn around. Or Graham Cook says, have another thought. Okay, so that's why I've been doing it. I'm going to turn around and try it another way. And when your routines become a rut, it's time to turn around. Or when someone says to me, uh, I, I just don't like this. It's rubbing me the wrong way. Well, this simple answer. Turn around. <laughs> If it's rubbing you the wrong way, it could be the Holy Spirit trying to tell you something. So we need repentance. In, in the Hebrew, it's Shabbat, which means to return. And uh, the classic scripture where this is used is in Isaiah 30, 15. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. The Lord has given us a, a way out. He's given us a way out. When we're when we are in, we have been in these situations. We've been in sin. We've been in transgression. Uh, we've been in iniquity. We've been doing our thing. We've been rebellious. We, whatever whatever it is, we have a way out. Turn around. Repent. So Adam and Eve turned away from God and started walking in the wrong direction. They just turned away from God and they committed high treason against the kingdom of heaven and against the king of kings. They turned their back on him and started walking away. And God has been calling out to every man and woman to turn around and come back to him. Come home. Come home. And that's why we were saying earlier, I, I have not had the opportunity yet, Lord will probably give the opportunity, to say to somebody, I don't care what you believe or you don't believe, what you do or what you don't do, but I'm telling you this simple question. When are you going to come home? When are you going to come home? Well, how do I come home? I'm glad you asked. His name is Jesus, and he is the door to get through into your house. Whew. Luke 
uh, three, two through three, uh, two through three. In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, and he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Do you realize how radical this is? This is not how sins got cleansed. Sins got taken care of once a year on the day, day of atonement. That's how he took care of sin. What's he doing? He's out there plunking people in the water for, and telling them, for the forgiveness of your sins. I mean, this was a really an upset to the whole system. This isn't how the system worked. And he's out here doing this. But look what he's preaching. is repentance and forgiveness of sins. He was telling these people, you need to turn around. You're going, you've been going the wrong direction. It's time to come home. It's time to turn around. So repentance is not just turning away from something, but it is turning to someone and his perfect plan and his kingdom ways. It's turning to someone, turning to his perfect plan and his kingdom ways, saying, Lord, you've got a plan. Before I was born, before I was born, before I was, when I was conceived, my conviction, when I was conceived, you had a plan. You started writing a book. And it took you nine months to write the book. And you got the book done, and then boom, here I am. And then that book was written all the days that were ordained for me. And your thoughts toward me are greater than the sand. You were thinking about me nonstop about what you wanted to do in my heart and my life and, and, and where you wanted me to go and, and what you wanted me to accomplish. You were thinking of all of those things. What was he thinking? John, what was he thinking? Oh, yeah, there you go. Totally. And nothing but success. He did not think or pre-plan sickness, illness, disease, failure. He didn't pre-plan any of that. That was not written into the book. He wrote a wonderful, amazing story. But the fact of the matter is we all started off looking the wrong direction. We started off with our eyes on the world, under the power of the law of sin and death. Satan was out there in control. We were in the cycle. And sin and death is a cycle. Sin, death. Sin, death, sin, death. Temptation, sin, death. Temptation, sin, death. It was a cycle. And that's where we were at. And what happened was the soul was in submission to the body, the physical body. And the physical body has some innate appetites that are not there. The body is not thinking. This flesh is not thinking. It's not sentient. It has no thought. The physical body. But it has some needs that are there. The body needs warmth. The body needs water. The body needs food. It needs, it needs sleep. It needs intimacy. They're, these things are all a part of the flesh. They're all, and so when we use that word, we're going to go back and spend a lot more time talking about that. But the point is, it, th this body itself is not sin. It's just a body. It's a container. But this container has a propensity towards things that make it feel good. You introduce a little bit of heroin, and this physical body goes, oh, I like that. That felt pretty good. Not that it's thinking, but it's sending back these messages. That the body's going, oh, that felt good. Or, or when you're sitting there and you're, you're hungry, or, or you're, you feel kind of worn down or worn out, or you've got a little bit of headache, and you go get a bottle of water, you drink the water, and you're like, oh, the headache goes away. The physical body needed water, and it was telling them, sending you some signals. You need water. But the body itself is not sin. But the soul, we started off with our, our all we were thinking as, as uh, we wanted to indulge this body. We've done that in a variety of ways. But the spirit, who knows what the spirit is in this situation? This is the before. We don't know what the spirit is. We have no idea. Jesus, no clue. And then somewhere, somewhere along the line, Jesus came into our hearts and lives and things changed. We turned around. And when we turn around, we come under the royal law of liberty. When we come under the royal law of liberty, God breaks the power of the law of sin and death because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus was broken. And Satan's power was put nullified. And we turn our attention now from the flesh, the soul being in charge, to the spirit being in charge. Now, I'm going to say this, too, is, is that this is not, we're, we're not just flipping a switch. Oh, okay, spirit's in charge now. All right, flip switch, spirit, you're in charge now. 
I wish it happened like that, but it, I've not found it to be like that. I've had to sit there and say, okay, Holy Spirit, teach me what it means to have the Spirit in control and not the soul. Good. Teach me. how, Because how do you do that? You know, and only Holy Spirit can teach us because it's such a personal thing. And what that, what does that mean? And what, what would that even feel like? Well, it feels pretty good. When the Spirit takes control and the soul is following the Spirit's lead, that is the, that is the divine order. That's the way it's supposed to be. And he can do it. And then he will feed to us through our natural senses and our spiritual senses. He'll speak, uh, speak to our soul. But he, what he's doing in our soul is a refining process. The soul is being refined. The soul is being cleansed. The soul is being purified. The soul is being purged, pur purged, purified, and refined. The soul is going through that process. But the more we learn what that means, Holy Spirit, teach me. And then there's this moment where you're sitting there going, Whoa, let me catch my breath, Holy Spirit. Because I can, I feel the spirit of the living God. This, my spirit uh, uh, in the image of God is rising up and taking up. I am not being ruled by my soul. My soul is not, the broken places in my soul are not running my life. The broken places in my soul are not running my life. The Holy Spirit connected to the Spirit now has taken authority in the, in the rightful place that it should be in my life. So we have to learn. Holy Spirit has to take each one of us to this process of learning. What, what, how does that work? How does the Spirit take arise? What does that feel like? How, how do I make that shift? And how do I know the shift has happened? Holy Spirit, you're going to have to teach me. Because it's normal. This is the way we were created to be. So it's actually just be returning to normal. We, we have just been so, most of us, uh, that Holy Spirit can teach us how to do it. So what is re repentance is not. Repentance is not conviction only. <coughs> oh, you're right. That was wrong. It's not conviction only. It's just someone going, you know, or like the, like the kid was, a uh, teenager was asked what, what sin is. And sin is uh, doing something wrong and getting caught. It's not just getting caught and feeling sorry for yourself because you've been found out or you were corrected or you were rebuked or you were arrested. It's not just conviction. There's a lot of people that experience conviction. Oh, my gosh, I, was, I wish I hadn't done that. But their hearts have not changed at all. It's certainly not worldly sorrow. And, and this is something that you run, into, uh, all too, uh, you run into all too often is people that are caught or are become aware of a sin or something in their lives will fall into self-pity. They'll, they'll go into this thing of worldly sorrow. It's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry I did that. And they're just crying, you know, with buckets, you know. But they haven't changed. They're sorry. They're, they're really, real, you know, they're really sad. It is not self-help. It's like, well, I just need to do better. I need to do better. I'm going to go read several self-help books and, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out how I can do better in the future. That's not going to fix it. It's not being religious. Well, I just need to read my Bible more. I just need to go to church more. I just need to pray. Uh, I need to pray for five hours. I, I need to pray in the Holy Spirit for, for two hours. As a, as a re reaction to being called on sin, transgression, or iniquity. It's not being, being religious is not what's going to fix this problem. And it's certainly not mental assent. It's not just sitting in there going, yeah, you're right. That was probably wrong. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that was kind of a bonehead thing, you know. Uh, gee, wow, you know. But there's nothing. The fact of the matter is, there is no change of heart. The heart hasn't changed. Many religions, actually pretty much all the religions, other than the ones that have connected with Jesus, uh, are teaching people how to put on religious behavior. They put the religious behavior on, uh, you know, we put the religious garments upon ourselves, and all of a sudden, because I'm, I'm wearing a religious garment, you know, uh, I think of some of our friends in the Middle East and, and different places, you know, that just because I put that on does not change my heart. And the other thing, too, is there, there are stories of men in history who attempted to change by act of their will. Mm -hmm. they, they made a decision out of the act of, I will not do that again, as, as with willpower. Okay, there's no heart change, and and, and many of those have ended up in uh, uh, with uh, mental breakdowns, because what they realized was you cannot change the heart 
through mental assent, right? Like, I will quit swearing. I will. I will. I plan to. I'm going to fight not to swear, right? Yep. Or, 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 or uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to quit smoking tomorrow. White knuckle it. Yep. I'm going to try. I'm going to try real I'm hard. Try change. There's no heart change. And the fact of the matter is, we cannot change our own heart. We cannot change our own heart. Holy Spirit has to be the one to change our heart. That's why we've been saying, holiness is not achieved. Holiness is received. We have to receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're the only one that can change my heart. I know last week um, we were talking about holiness, and then Danny and I continued the conversation. And I said, it's, it still kind of sounds a little bit like works, because we're supposed to act a certain way, be a certain way. And that's when you said, it, it's not anything we do on our own. It's nothing that we achieve, but it's something that he can give us. And he can burn up those things. And he does. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, um, again, since Memorial Day for me, there's been a profound work being done in my heart. And Holy Spirit's doing it. He's doing it. Mm -hmm. And when you wake up every day, well, let me just say this. When you put your head on the pillow at night and you have contentment because the slate is clean mm -hmm. and you're at peace, you're at peace with uh, your, yourself, you're at peace with your loved ones. You're at peace with the Father. You're at peace. That is so precious. Yes? I have a testimony to this because I was a great works person. And after it, and when I came to the point of a breakdown, where I, 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 I couldn't go any further. And the Lord said, I'm not in love with you. I'm in love with who you are, not what you do. But then he took me to the scripture that said, that little verse that says, oh yeah, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, but that's verse 12, Philippians 2, but the 13th verse said, for it is God within you who works. Right. My part was to line up with what he's working on and agree with it and let him do the work in me that does the transformation. And that scripture in uh, Thessalonians, the God, God himself will sanctify you. God himself will sanctify you. He is faithful to do it. He's faithful to do it. So it, thank the Lord that uh, it, it, we, we depend. But what, what's amazing and what I've been personally experiencing is the more I invite Holy Spirit in, he's doing it. He's doing it. When you wake up in the morning and there's revelation knowledge and, and the Holy Spirit speaking to you and, and you have these, in, the, you're just in that place of warmth next to him when you're in that unapproachable light that you can only get through because he's done a sanctifying work inside of you. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, and I will I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them, and I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of uh, a heart of flesh. He God say, I will do that. <clears throat> Rather than being told you gotta do it, just let let him do it. And invite him. Lord, I want that heart of flesh. And if there's any stony places inside my heart, I want them gone. Come in, Holy Spirit. All right. Good. Steps of repentance. Here's the steps. You become aware of a need to repent. That's conviction. Oops. Confess or agree with God audibly in detail. You're right, God. That was wrong. And we always we tell people, uh, especially when we minister to the kids in Kenya, this really came up quite a bit, is because they would ask questions that teenagers ask when they're in challenges. And one of the things we said to those kids is, when, you're, when you've missed it, you've blown it, you go to the Father, you confess in detail, in detail, audibly, exactly what happened, how you got there, how you, what you did, and where you're at right now. That right there alone, do you, do you, have, do you have any impact what that impact is? And believe me, it stops some behavior right in his tracks. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, with, with in detail, acknowledge you're wrong and say, you are right, Lord, I am sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? And he will always forgive us. Steps of repentance. <clears throat> Receive the Father's forgiveness through Jesus because he's going to give you that forgiveness. Father's going to give you forgiveness. Then, you, then thank you, Father, for, for your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And then I forgive myself. I forgive myself. And you have to do these things audibly. 
I forgive myself. So I'm going to change the way I think and act with the Holy Spirit's help. Holy Spirit, I need your help. Because if, without your help, you know, Brother Lawrence in uh, the uh, Practice of the Presence, he said, he said in the Practice of the Presence, he said, without your help, I will always do it. I will always do this. I need your help. And then let go of the stigma of sin. Because the one thing that the enemy would love to do, and especially the more egregious our fall is, is you sit there and you go through the process. Oh, Father, forgive me. Oh, thank you, Father, you forgive me. I am forgiven. And, oh, and I do choose to forgive myself. I forgive myself. And then you're sitting there, you know, because your emotions have been roughed up. You've just gone through a process. You blew it. And you know you did. And you just confessed it, which is not easy. And it hurts. And then you go through the whole thing of accepting the Lord's forgiveness. Oh, God. And then you forgive yourself. Oh, God, I forgive myself. And then you sit there, and then, then the Lord, the Holy Spirit says, okay, now I want you to go preach. Now, wait a minute. You're, who are you to get up and present yourself as though you're some kind of man of God or woman of God after what you did? Now, you've already gone through the repentance. You did it. You asked for forgiveness. You went through the whole thing. God forgave you. You forgave yourself. And then the enemy comes along and goes, well, who do you think you are? You think you're all holy and righteous now? That's the lie of Satan. And, and um, that's why we always say uh, repentance is not complete until you are doing what you were created to do in the first place. So we invite the sanctifying fire of the Holy Spirit. I can't say this enough. This is probably one of the most powerful things that I've been experiencing. I'm saying fire of Holy Spirit, sanctify. I welcome the fire of the Holy Spirit to come in Amen. and sanctify me. Um, there are rewards. God will pardon you. Heaven rejoices. Blessings, not a curse. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And there's no condemnation. Fruit of repentance is you have a clear conscience. I mean, what a gift to have a clear conscience. Peace of mind. That's over with. Now, Get up, or in, in the Old Testament terms, gird up your loins like a man and let's go. Okay, you did it. You slipped. You fell. You skinned your knee. Okay, it's over with. You repented. Now get up and let's get back on it. Let's get going. Restored warmth of the Lord's presence in your life. And that is such a joy to have, just to have that restoring warmth flood back into your heart. So, oh, Jesus. Restored fellowship with friends and family. Because a lot of times people, what ends up happening when they go into some of these areas or when they have fallen into sin or transgressions or iniquities, they, they lose relationships. Relationships are broken. And, and, and a lot of times, too, they, they don't want to be around people, you know, depending on what they've done. They don't want to be around people. You know, I can think back to my early days as a believer and as a young man. You don't want to be around people when you blew it, whatever blew it means to you. Restore fellowship and friendship with family to have a clear conscience. You become an object of compassion. You become, you have a testimony because you now are an object of compassion. Look what God did for me. I was one way, but now I'm another. He chose me. And in between, he was there. In between, he was there. So the fruit of repentance is resume your journey, your destiny, your assignment. There's no guilt, no shame, no regret, clear conscience, walk forward as if it never happened. Freedom from the stigma of sin. Boom, you go forward. That is over. That is done. There is a uh, legal term called res judicata, and what that means is once it has been adjudicated, once the gavel has dropped and you've been declared not guilty, you, it cannot be brought up again. You cannot bring it up again. When God says you're forgiven, it's done. The enemy has no legal right to walk up to you and go, yeah, but what about this you did? It's like, excuse me, snake lips, or the forever loser, like Tim calls, Sheets calls him. Really? <laughs> the forever loser, or, or what I've heard, the, the snake lips. Well, like who is a her? Huh? Loser. Yeah, exactly. So, so you cannot, it cannot be brought up again. Excuse me. Get out of here in Jesus' name. All right. Romans 2, 4, do not think, do not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and the tolerance and patience, not, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. The father's like going, kids, I want you, you know, it breaks his heart when he sees us, you know, having done something that we 
probably shouldn't have or thought a way we shouldn't have thought of or, or whatever it is. It breaks his heart. But in his kindness and his tolerance and his patience, he's saying, let's fix this through repentance. Just, just, just believe. All you got to do is say, I'm sorry. Turn around. Have a different thought. There are people that say, well, God's judgmental. You know, they always seem to have everything. But he gave us an out. He did. He does is does seek justice, but he gives us an out when we've grown it. So he is a loving God. That's why his kindness is about it. We're going to go over just a little bit. But 2 Corinthians 7.10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of this world produces death. The Lord doesn't want us sitting there, you know, he's not going to beat us up. You know, I, I, in the Navy, uh, I was I was leading a, a team down in San Diego with the project. Uh, one day, an officer came up and uh, told me, you, you need to do this. Well, he was an officer, so I did it. Well, then a, a, a senior enlisted come up to me and says, you are the captain of that. That, that, that is, you are in charge of that. That officer had no right to tell you what to do. You needed to tell him. That, 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 that he needed to go about his business and leave your business alone. That man would never let me forget it. Year after year, he would remind me. Do you remember when you, back when you did this thing? Always wanting to put the guilt back on him. Right. You know, I remember when. Like he's you know? him elevated and you low. Oh, exactly. But God leads us to a repentance without regret. You know, Thank there's something real sweet about true repentance. It's just sweet. It's sweet. It is. It is. It's wonderful. Uh, and I just thank God that in 1500, when one of my relatives killed one of Cheryl's relatives, <laughs> and she's, she let me off the hook and has not reminded me of that terrible, oh, dastardly really? deed. Oh, dear. Yeah, we found that out through. <laughs> so Micah 7, 7 through 9, if you stumble, we get back up again. As for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. You might as well not just get all excited. Because if I fall, I will get back up again. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. And again, we're looking at this particular scripture through the lens of the Old Testament. Thank the Lord that through the New Testament and through Jesus, he is more than happy to bring us out into the light immediately. All right, so uh, 1 Kings 5, 850, forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their, all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you and make them objects of compassion. We will have a testimony. I was one way, but now I'm another. I have not been lily white. I have not been perfect. I've made mistakes. I've been down those roads of, of, of selfishness and self-centeredness and pride. I've been down those roads, but thank God he was patient enough out of his love and mercy and tolerance to give us an opportunity, give me an opportunity to repent and turn around. Errors in judgment is not sin. John, 1 John 3, 20. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. An error does not become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Too much salt in the stew is not sin. To turn left when I should have turned right is not sin. That's a mistake. To, 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 uh, to write and forget to put punctuation in that should be there is an error, but it's not sin. So we have to understand the enemy would like to point his fingers at us because we did something kind of silly. You know, pronounce somebody's name wrong. You know, and the enemy wants to point his finger and say, well, look at that. You know, you weren't very smart there. You know, or, um, you know, like I said, uh, you, you didn't put enough spice in your in your uh, sauce or something. Yeah. So what's the show summary? Here's the last one. First John 1, 7, 9. But if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yes. Amen. All right. We <laughs> really blitzed through that. <laughs> but I think it's uh, 
it, it is important uh, because we see a lot of people around us. They are they are sad. They've made egregious mistakes. Uh, whatever that mistake was, they've done it, and, and they're lost in guilt. They're lost in shame, and, uh, and and then you'll hear some of these people say, "Well, God would never forgive me because of what I did. God will never forgive me because of what I've done." And so they're, they bought into a lie, and they're bound in that lie, and they don't understand God is giving you this amazing gift of repentance to turn around, take his love, accept his forgiveness, have a different way of thinking, because the Holy Spirit will help you have another way of thinking. He will help you turn around. His fire will come in and burn up whatever was susceptible there, whatever propensity you had to do something that you did. That fire will come in and clean you up. So just invite it in. And then he'll do it. Repentance. Well, there was the part we were talking about, like your own self-will. That was understand, right? And I'm just remembering a time when Ellie, uh, my, one of my granddaughters, was only four. And uh, her mom goes, hold Grandma's hand or hold my hand. And she goes, I hold my own hand. And she tried to walk across the street like this, holding her hands. Like that's going to protect her. Whereas mm -hmm. an adult would be a protection, but it was that self-will. Hold my own hand. Exactly. So, um, all right. Well, I just pray, Father, that everyone in this, hears this message, will hear your heart through it. That, Father, you're not a judgmental Lord. You're not a judgmental God. You're not sitting up there just wanting to hurt and harm those of us that have made terrible mistakes in our lives. That is not who you are. You are not a judgmental God. You are a loving, loving Father was simply saying, come back home, kids. Come back. It's okay. We can fix this. Together, we can fix this. You need to repent. You need to turn around. You need to think different than what you're thinking right now. And I will help you with that. I will even help you with that. Just be willing to let go. And be honest. And this phrase we've been saying a lot these last few months is, just come clean. Father, I just come clean with you. Yes. You know, this is, I've been here, I've been there, I've had this thought, I've had that thought, I've had this temptation or that temptation. Let's just be honest. Come clean with him and say, Father, burn it up. Or as we say all the time, Father, be a part of my thoughts right now. Be a part of my thoughts right now. Instantly. This has been my experience for quite some time. Instantly, Father will come in and stop that negative thought. Good. He will. He does. And then he then he puts me in a, 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 there's been a few times where it's like, you know, him putting his arms around you and looking down this road saying, you want to go down that road? You, you really want to go down that road? This is the road of self-pity, self-condemnation, a fear, doubt, and unbelief. Do you really want, how, you want to go down that road? If you're going down it, you're going by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going by yourself. I'm not going with you down that road. How, how's that working? And, and then to pull back and say, you know what? I think I'm going to have another thought. <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road. Sometimes but, it takes the help of another person or a pastor or someone. Because I had to do that. I was in terrible, deep guilt and shame after my divorce. And, and I was beat up. I mean, it took me several years. And I finally went to the pastor and, and we prayed. And oh my gosh. It broke off. And that was like Horrible, horrible garbage just all over me. Well, and I agree with you. Thank the Lord that He gives us a family to process with. Right. And there are times I agree with you. There are times, um, you know, where we just sometimes we just need someone to help us have perspective. We lose perspective, right. you right. know, and we just need some a friend to come along and say, "Have you considered?" 